Well, welcome. It's uh, good to have you with us today. And I'm uh, really, it's privileged to have John Ortberg with us. John, welcome. It's a privilege for me to be here. Thank you. So uh, you uh, may or may not be familiar with John's story. He's, uh, he's been an author, written a number of books. We see him speaking at some great events, uh, but uh, also senior pastor of Menlo Church out in Menlo Park, California. So it's good to have you with us, John. It's a place to live, but somebody has to do it. Somebody um, has to do that. That's right. Well, uh, the reason I have you here with us, John, is through the years I've watched uh, as you've been a great champion for a number of uh, important uh, critical components of what a healthy church looks like. But specifically today, I wanted to talk about uh, how you've really championed women in leadership in the church. Uh, and I know this has been a journey for you too personally. And so I'd love for you to kind of go back and share where you started in this journey and what has brought you to where you are today on this topic. Yeah, I am. Um... I grew up in a great church back in Rockford, Illinois. It was a Baptist church, and I'm super thankful for it. Uh, it really helped her and taught about a personal relationship with Jesus. So overwhelmingly a positive um, experience. Um, on the issue of gender roles, it was a place where there was an understanding that uh, certain roles were restricted to men, particularly around preaching and teaching and leadership. And I can remember um, my mom was allowed to um, like wash the tablecloth they would put on the communion table, but not to actually serve communion. <laughs> and so um, there were those kind of restrictions. I didn't think about it a whole lot as I was growing up and um, probably not even a great deal when I went to college. And then when I went to seminary, I had a class that was taught by a woman, Roberta Hestinus is her name. And it was about women and men in the Bible. Um, and it was the first time that I had really devoted time to taking a look at what did the Bible actually have to say about the role of women and men and studied it with kind of fresh eyes in a very comprehensive way. And I can remember one of the first um, items that struck me was um, in Genesis, after the man and the woman are both created in the image of God, and just to learn that in the ancient world, it was often thought that um, you know, in pantheons, a great God would have the king made in his image. But to say that the man and the woman are both equal image bearers of God was quite unique and had pretty strong implications. But then um, after the fall comes the curse, and part of the curse is um, the woman being told, your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. Hmm. And I had always kind of been taught, always uh, assumed that, the man ruling over the woman was part of God's intent for a created order. And it came as a great surprise to me just to stop and realize, no, that wasn't the plan from creation. That was actually part of the curse that Jesus came to redeem us from. And so it was really a whole uh, a semester of, of learning, going through texts all the way from the Old Testament through the New Testament um, and looking at what the Bible actually says about women and men with fresh eyes that was the single most um, uh, influential part of my own journey about the Bible and gender roles. So, John, I don't know if this will surprise you or not, but as our team continues to work with churches across the country, what, what we find uh, is not unlike the marketplace generally, that women make up a half or more of mm -hmm. the staff working for a church, but the percentage of women in leadership roles is very, very small. Yeah. Um, in fact, uh, what's uh, most, uh, uh, I would say a little discouraging, but particularly with the largest of the churches that we work with. So the larger it gets, the less likely it is for women to be particularly in senior leadership roles. Mm -hmm. So help, help us, where's the disconnect and how do, how do we move, move past this? Well, it's a huge issue. I mean, I think um, if it's true that God has created women as well as men to be in his image, and if it's true that he has gifted women as he has men, and I think that is true, and if it's true that he wants both of them to exercise dominion in the world as his image bearer, then for the church to access men but not women in key roles is kind of like, you know, playing with one arm tied behind your back. Mm -hmm. And that's not a good way to play any game, especially one that really matters. Um, I think part of the reality is it's never been different. It's not like there was an era in the church where um, 
women were being unleashed, deployed, valued in that way, and then we lost it. So it's not like, um, you know, we, we lost that ability somewhere along the line. We've never really gained that muscle. And even the marketplace shows in many respects um, what a challenge it can be. And I know for myself, um, uh, the belief, the commitment to the notion that women as well as men are gifted by God, called by God, um, to be deployed by God, is something that I embrace deeply. But that can be a little different than practice. And I know in my own marriage with Nancy, it's like I believe in men and women mutually submitting to each other and living together as servants. But when it comes down to actually serving around the house, um, what I think of as my commitment often falls very far short. And I do think in the church, there are often um, barriers, not just theological. I think about sometimes in the church, in the church's eagerness to um, avoid sexual sin or sexual scandal, hmm. churches can create practices like pastors who are men or leaders who are men saying, you know, I would never meet a woman for lunch. I would never be alone in my office with a woman. I would never be alone in a car with women. And um, it's a little bit like in Jesus' day, there would be certain rabbis that followed a strategy of isolation. You know, I'll never mm -hmm. touch a woman, never talk to a woman. Never, but, but then women never get mentored. They never get developed. They never have an opportunity to develop the kind of relationships that all of us find so crucial for our growth. Mm -hmm. So those of us that are in church leadership and that are men, have to look at not just what's my theology around this, but what's my practice? What kind of relationships am I intentional about um, cultivating? And how do I make sure that I'm in relationships with gifted women as well as gifted men and have the appropriate kind of safeguards and accountability, um, but make sure that in my anxiety to avoid sin or scandal, I don't end up isolating women from opportunities to develop that they need. And that can be just as sinful as sexuals. Yeah. So what are you, what are you seeing? What's your perspective uh, in recent years? Are the questions beginning to change about women in leadership and are we making any progress? Um, I think we're making progress, although I think it's slower than what God would want it to be. Um, I think that, um, Women are pursuing mentoring more, and I think that's a really good thing. Um, I think that partly for the reasons that I just talked about, sometimes that mentoring happens too much just women to women. And it's interesting, uh, I was just reading this book, not particularly a plug for it, but it's called Mastering Leadership. And it's a fascinating book about leadership. Part of what they look at is just empirical research on the nature of leadership and the kinds of gifts that women tend to bring to leadership for whatever reason, however much it might be cultural, biological, whatever, um, but their ability to connect personally with the people that they lead and communicate relational care um, tends to be significantly higher than men. And um, so I think there's an increasing awareness about that. I think it's being talked about more, but I think it tends to be talked about, it, it tends to be a bit ghettoized. Yeah. And it still tends to be networks of women that talk with each other about it. Uh, but I, I, think, I think we have yet to see churches and leaders, including male leaders, who will courageously champion this and say, uh, we want to build networks of leadership and leadership development um, that uh, intentionally involve women as well as men and listen and learn from women about what's needed for our churches to function better as um, equal opportunity uh, communities. So in addition to diving into scripture, um, uh, maybe revisiting mm -hmm. uh, what we've been taught in the past, what are some other building blocks that churches can begin to put in place to hopefully develop a culture that seeks to empower women in their leadership, John? Um, well, for one thing, if you're in a church leadership position, senior pastor, pastoral staff, wherever, just make a list of who are the people that you're trying to mentor, who are the people that you're seeking to develop, and make sure that there's a balance there of um, women and men. And then part of what that requires is uh, I do need to teach my staff, our leadership team, about how do women and men serve together, be friends together, work together, and make sure they don't cross lines that they shouldn't cross uh, in terms of sexuality or intimacy. So... Um, with our staff, we'll talk about um, the secret test. I never want to keep a secret with a woman that I withhold from my wife mm -hmm. 
or the sibling test. Um, I don't want to be engaged with another woman in behavior that I wouldn't engage with my sister with. Mm. Um, or the screen test. Is any conversation or interaction I have with another woman one that I would be comfortable being up on a screen in front of our whole congregation? And so whatever that kind of teaching is, teach the staff um, what are the safeguards that we do need so we don't end up defaulting to a strategy of isolation. Um, I think teaching about what does the Bible say about women and men in ministry, and there's a lot of wonderful resources that are available um, for learning about this great material that that folks will be able to access to teach on it, Um, but, but to have teaching for congregations uh, I did a talk on this from Menlo, I think a year or two ago, actually on Mother's Day, hmm. um, and um, to have teaching so that I'm raising that awareness for other folks on our staff. That's a really key thing. I had a conversation earlier this morning with a, a young woman on our staff who just has terrific teaching gifts. Hmm. And one of the questions I asked her was, do you want to become a senior pastor? And it was really interesting. One of her comments to me was, nobody has asked me that question before. Mm -hmm. I will guarantee you, if she had that same set of gifts, but she was a man, somebody would have asked her that question before. Mm -hmm. So asking developmental questions, what are your dreams for yourself? Where do you see yourself? And just naming, I think I see this in you. So uh, kind of looking back at your journey again, John, can you you share a story or two of how you've watched as, as the church has embraced this gifting in women, how that has impacted the health and really the impact of the church as a whole? Um, Kind of a fun story on this one. When I met my wife and we started dating, um, she had been involved in a church. She worked at a church. She has very strong gifts of teaching and leading. Uh, And she was actually teaching and helping to lead at a large church, a group of college and young adult men and women. So she's leading men and teaching men, but she had only been exposed to a theology that said women are not supposed to do that. So actually, our first argument when we were dating was about gender roles in the Bible. <laughs> I was arguing that women should be allowed to teach and lead, and she was arguing the other side. <laughs> it didn't take long for her to reverse fields on that at all. Um, but she had just never been exposed to anything else. And watching God news the teaching gifts and the leadership gifts that he placed in my wife has just been an amazing journey. And both of them are present in her in such rich ways. And we um, joined the staff of uh, church in Chicago, Willow Creek community church um, over 20 years ago now. And Nancy came on staff and then eventually she became the leader of what was called um, access, which was kind of their ministry to young adults, that next generation of leadership. Mm-hmm. And um, the way that that ministry grew under her leadership and just thrived, and that a whole generation of young leaders, men and women, got developed under Nancy, and to this day, she is in touch with them. Um, they adore her. She confronted them. She loved them. She challenged them um, at every level in their ministry, in their giftedness, in their failings, in their dating life like you name it. And, and Willow got marked by that. A generation of leaders got marked by that in a way that they never would have. And I mostly credit myself for that because I'm the one that had the argument with her that said you ought to be teaching. Them. <laughs> hey, John, if you won any other arguments with your wife? <laughs> no, that's the only one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and that's been 34 years ago. <laughs> Well, very good. John, again, um, uh, in addition to what you shared today, I just really have uh, appreciated the way you've uh, opened up this conversation for the church. I, it's, I think it's a healthy conversation for us to have. And really, regardless of where you land on this, I think it, it, it will be help you in your leadership and in your spiritual journey to really embrace this dialogue. Uh, so again, I'm grateful, John, for you uh, joining us today. Any other final thoughts you want to share on this, or and can you recommend any other resources other than scripture, obviously, that you could point us to uh, to uh, maybe engage this a little bit further? You know, th- there's a ton of books on this topic. Uh, one of the classics is by Gilbert Bilzekian, who was an old New Testament professor of mine called Beyond Sex Roles, and so that would be well worth a look. But if you Google the topic, you know, there's just Great, great resources, and and more are coming out all the time. The the one other uh, comment that I would make is, if you're a woman and you're listening to this, and you think God has given you gifts 
around teaching or you think God has given you gifts around leadership, then teach, then lead. Pray about it, develop them, ask people to help you, look for mentoring, look for opportunities, don't hold back. The world needs you, the church needs you, God has plans for you. For God's sake, teach and lead. Yeah, very good. Thanks again, John. Thanks, Tony.